On a Friday afternoon in late September of 2007, the air inside Google's Mountain View headquarters was not filled with the hum of innovation, but with the silent, grinding frustration of waiting. Large-scale software compilation had become a thief of time. For engineers working on the massive C++ codebases that powered the search giant's infrastructure, a simple build could take 45 minutes. In that dead space, attention drifted and focus shattered. It was in this atmosphere of simmering inefficiency that three men began a discussion that would eventually dismantle the established order of back-end engineering. They were not young disruptors seeking fame. They were veterans of Bell Labs, the research facility that had birthed the transistor and the laser. Robert Griesemer, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson decided that the complexity of modern programming was not a sign of sophistication, but a failure of design. They began to sketch a solution on a whiteboard, a language that would trade the intellectual vanity of academic theory for the brutal efficiency of industrial construction. They named it Go. The technology they conceived was a statically typed, compiled programming language, designed explicitly for systems that operate at a massive scale. It was built to handle the chaotic reality of networked servers, where thousands of processes occur simultaneously. For me, uh, <clears throat> the reason I uh, was enthusiastic about Go is because just about the same time that we were starting on Go, I read or tried to read the uh, C++0x uh, proposed standard, and uh, that was the convincer for me. <laughs> Unlike the heavy, ornamental languages of the time, which prioritized abstraction, Go was ruthless in its simplicity. It offered garbage collection to manage memory automatically, freeing the programmer from the drudgery of manual allocation that plagued C++. It introduced a concurrency model based on communicating sequential processes, a mathematical theory from the 1970s that allowed disparate parts of a program to talk to one another without locking up the entire system. To the uninitiated, Go looked almost primitive. It lacked the features that computer scientists loved to debate at conferences. It had no inheritance, no method overloading, and for a very long time, no generics. This was not an oversight. It was a calculated gambit to prevent programmers from being clever at the expense of being clear. The pedigree of its creators lent the project an immediate, undeniable gravity. Ken Thompson had designed the B programming language and was the principal creator of the Unix operating system. He had already shaped the computing world once. Rob Pike was a member of the Unix team and a co-creator of the UTF-8 character encoding that allowed computers to display text in almost any human language. Robert Griesmer had worked on the V8 JavaScript engine, which powered the Chrome browser. These were men who understood the bedrock of computing. They were not interested in the fickle trends of application development. They were interested in the plumbing. They worked in the shadow of the Googleplex, creating a tool that would allow Google to scale its operations without drowning in the maintenance costs of C++ or the slow execution of Python. They wanted a language that compiled in seconds, not minutes. When Google released Go to the Public as an open source project in November of 2009, the reception was mixed. The academic community found it regressive. They looked at its lack of features and declared it a step backward, a blunt instrument in an age of precision tools. But systems engineers saw something else. They saw a weapon against complexity. The language began to seep into the cracks of the industry, adopted first by the restless and the pragmatic. It was not a sudden explosion, but a slow, creeping colonization of the server room. The turning point arrived with the rise of containerization. Solomon Hikes and his team at DotCloud, a platform as a service company, were looking for a way to package applications so they could run anywhere. They chose Go to build their engine. They called it Docker. Docker changed how software was shipped, and because Docker was written in Go, the language became the de facto dialect of cloud infrastructure. This was solidified further when Google open-sourced Kubernetes, a system for automating the deployment of containerized applications. Kubernetes was the steering wheel for the cloud, and it was forged in Go. Suddenly, the entire ecosystem of modern infrastructure, the tools that keep the internet running, from Netflix streaming servers to banking transactions, was being rewritten in this austere, Google-born language. The impact was practical and immediate. Companies found that they could hire junior developers and have them writing production-ready code in weeks rather than months. 
The strict formatting rules of Go, which forced all code to look exactly the same regardless of who wrote it, eliminated hours of pointless arguments over style. It turned programming from an expressive art into a predictable industrial process. The financial implications of this shift are difficult to overstate, though they are often buried in the ledgers of operational efficiency. The global cloud computing market is valued in the hundreds of billions of dollars. The efficiency gains from using Go lower memory footprints, faster startup times, and higher concurrency translate directly into saved electricity and reduced hardware costs. When a company like Uber migrated their geofence lookup service from Node.js to Go, they experienced a 99% reduction in latency. For a company operating at that scale, milliseconds are worth millions of dollars. American Express used Go to modernize its payment networks. The BBC used it to handle the massive traffic of its online games. Monzo, a challenger bank in the United Kingdom, built its entire banking backend on hundreds of microservices written in Go. The language enabled a shift in architecture from massive, monolithic blocks of code to tiny, independent services that could be updated and repaired without taking down the whole system. However, the rise of Go was not without its controversies, which simmered beneath the surface of its success. The most significant was a technical and cultural war over the inclusion of generics, a feature that allows programmers to write flexible, reusable code for different data types. For over a decade, the core team at Google refused to add them, citing the desire to keep the language simple and the compilation fast. This refusal created a deep rift. On one side was the Go team, led by Pike, maintaining a stoic, almost paternalistic stance that they knew what was best for the user. On the other side was a growing community of developers who felt patronized and handcuffed by the language's limitations. It was a tension between the authoritarian vision of the creators and the democratic desires of the users. It was not a legal battle, but a philosophical one about control. The debate became so heated that it dominated forums and conference halls for years, a testament to how deeply the language had embedded itself in the professional identity of its users. There were also quieter, more uncomfortable questions about corporate influence. Go is an open source project, but it is stewarded by Google. The language's development is funded by Google, its infrastructure is hosted by Google, and its core designers are employed by Google. Critics argued that the language evolved only in directions that served Google's internal needs, ignoring the requirements of the wider world. This is the shadow of the benevolent dictator. While other languages like Rust or Python are governed by foundations or diverse committees, Go remained firmly in the grip of the Mountain View giant. This centralization allowed for rapid, cohesive decision-making, but it also meant that the entire back-end industry was slowly becoming dependent on a tool shaped by the strategic interests of a single corporation. Comparing Go to its contemporaries reveals the nature of its specific genius and its specific flaws. Rust, another modern systems language, offers a guarantee of memory safety that Go cannot match, preventing entire classes of bugs that lead to security vulnerabilities. But Rust is notoriously difficult to learn, a sheer cliff face of cognitive load. Java, the old guard of enterprise software, offers a massive ecosystem and familiar patterns, but it carries the bloat of three decades of legacy decisions. Go positioned itself in the middle. It was not the fastest, nor the safest, nor the most feature-rich. It was simply the most productive. It accepted that human programmers are fallible and tired, and it gave them a tool that was hard to misuse. It was the AK-47 of programming languages, stamped out cheaply, loose in its tolerances, but reliable enough to work in the mud and the sand. To understand the technical heart of Go, one must look at the Go routine. In traditional programming, creating a new thread of execution, a separate line of work for the computer to handle, is expensive. It consumes a significant chunk of memory and requires the operating system to get involved. A server can only handle so many threads before it chokes. Go invented a way to create lightweight threads, called Go routines, that are managed by the Go runtime, not the operating system. A program can spawn tens of thousands, even millions, of Go routines on a single machine without crashing. This allowed developers to write software that could handle thousands of incoming web requests simultaneously, as if it were the easiest thing in the world. It democratized concurrency. Before Go, Writing highly concurrent network servers was a dark art practiced by only the most elite engineers. 
After Go, it was something a bootcamp graduate could do on a Tuesday. This technical capability reshaped the internet's architecture. It enabled the microservices revolution. Before Go, companies built software like a single, massive castle. If one wall crumbled, the castle fell. With Go, they began to build software like a fleet of small boats. If one boat sank, the rest kept sailing. This resilience is invisible to the average person, but it is the reason why your banking app works on Black Friday, or why Netflix does not crash when a new season of a popular show is released. The stability of the modern digital world is supported by millions of lines of Go code running in dark, air-conditioned data centers. There are lesser-known examples of Go's reach that paint a picture of its ubiquity. The malware authors of the world, always pragmatic, turn to Go to write ransomware. Its ability to cross-compile to be written on one machine and run on any other, whether it be Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, made it perfect for malicious software that needed to spread quickly. On the lighter side, the Hugo static site generator transformed how websites were built, moving away from heavy databases to simple, ultra-fast text files processed by Go. Even the Ethereum blockchain client, Geth, is written in Go, proving the language's competence in the high-stakes world of cryptocurrency, where a single bug can evaporate fortunes. The cultural impact of Go is a story of the shift from the heroic programmer to the reliable engineer. In the early days of computing, the programmer was a wizard, conjuring miracles through arcane knowledge. Go rejected this mythology. It treated code as a liability, not an asset. The philosophy was that code should be boring. It should be readable by anyone. It should be uniform. This shift mirrored the industrialization of software development. As tech companies grew from garages to skyscrapers, they could no longer rely on individual wizards. They needed armies of soldiers. Go was the standard issue rifle for that army. It fundamentally changed the hiring practices and onboarding speed of the tech industry. The controversy over generics eventually found a resolution, but it took 12 years. In March of 2022, with the release of Go version 1.18, generics were finally added to the language. It was a massive undertaking, requiring the designers to rewrite the heart of the language without breaking the existing code of thousands of companies. The release was met with a sigh of relief, but also a sense of trepidation. The purity was gone. The language had finally succumbed to the pressure of the crowd. Yet, the predicted disaster did not happen. The community absorbed the change and moved on, a testament to the robust foundation Pike and Thompson had laid. The broader impact on society is abstract, but profound. By lowering the barrier to entry for building high-performance network systems, Go accelerated the development of cloud-native technologies. It fueled the startup economy by allowing small teams to build systems that could scale to millions of users with minimal overhead. It greased the wheels of the information economy. Every time you use a cloud service, check a stock price, or stream a song, there is a high probability that your request is being routed, processed, or served by a program written in Go. It works in the background, uncelebrated and unseen. A digital infrastructure that functions with the reliable monotony of a public utility. In the end, the story of Go is not about a breakthrough in computer science theory. It is a story about understanding the psychology of work. Rob Pike, Ken Thompson and Robert Griesemer understood that in a world of increasing complexity, the most valuable asset is not raw power, but manageability. They looked at the chaotic, burning world of software development in 2007 and offered a way to impose order. They did not give the programmers what they said they wanted. They gave them what they needed. The result is a language that controls the back end of the internet, a silent leviathan that swallowed the cloud whole, not by being the smartest, but by being the most resilient. The waiting that plagued the engineers at Google is gone, replaced by the humming velocity of a world that moves too fast to look back.